from Ohio, and I'm here to say thank you for all of you to being here. There's an understanding about politics, and what people want you to do is to, is to understand how it works. And it, freedom has three stools. It has three parts. It has a spiritual part, it has an economic part, and it has a political part. And there will be those who will be spending a great deal of time on the spiritual part. And there, uh, David Barton and Bill Federer will be focusing on the political part. Therefore, mine is to give an explanation about the understanding that freedom is economic liberty of itself. There's a place called America. Only 4% of the population of the world call themselves Americans. Yet every year, that 4% write more books, more plays, more symphonies, more copyrights, more inventions than the other 96% combined. For thousands of years, people had hoped to someday fly. Americans invented the airplane and the light bulb and the telegraph and the telephone, put men on the moon. And currently, at this moment, there's a ship parking in the harbor in Hong Kong and Singapore using a global positioning system conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. Every airplane on the planet is doing it. There's a Mercedes dealer in Buenos Aires ordering a part from Stuttgart, Germany, using an internet conceived, invented, and maintained by Americans. Americans is not only blessed the world as no nation ever has, it is the standard for righteousness in the world. There's a reason why ships are not attacked on the high seas. Actually, they were over 300 times last year. And to whom can they appeal? If a nation is, a, if, a, if a, a trawler is attacked in the South China Sea, if a yacht is attacked in the Caribbean, if a British oil tanker is caught in the Straits of Hormuz and there are pirates, to whom can they say help? The standard for right and wrong is America. America will say, the 327,000 Americans who wear the uniform of the United States Navy, we're coming to your aid. We're keeping watch on where those pirates are going. We'll go after them. We'll take care of them. The, the reason that the world functions is because of the righteousness of America on our banking system. If some nation wants to counterfeit another's currency on the legal system, the list goes on and on and on. The scripture says if you take a city, must bind a strong man. There's only one strong man in the world. It's America. You take America down and the rest of it's a piece of cake. So this nation is the standard for right and wrong. When a tsunami hits the fourth largest nation on earth, hits the largest Muslim nation on earth, to whom do they appeal for aid? The glass towers of the Middle East? No, the Christians in America, because we come in and help. As nobody has been as generous or helpful as this nation has. Now, that nation has been entrusted to us. We have to make sure that we don't let it slip away. And that means, how do we do that? We don't elect people who want to fundamentally change America, lest we have no place else for us to go. Now, I have a, I lost my cheater right here. So, what, so I'm going to have to look over there to see what's happening. And, uh, and that, that is that in order for government to work, when you go to vote, I don't care if it's in Boston or Baghdad or Belgium or Buenos Aires, you only vote on two things. You vote on integrity, sense of right and wrong, and economics. I'm going to give you the conclusion right now, and then I'll explain it for the next 15 minutes. You only turn two dials. The higher the integrity, the higher the righteousness, that I can look you in the eye, shake a hand, and keep your word. The higher the integrity and the lower the burden of government, the less the government takes out of my paycheck and out of my pocket, the higher the integrity and the lower the cost, of, the greater the wealth. The lower the integrity, the more bars I have to put on the window, the more people I have to bribe to get a, a permit. The lower the integrity, the higher the cost of government, the greater the poverty. And politics is only turning those two dials. If you understand how to do it, you can make any rich place poor or any poor place rich. Let's see how it works. The, there's a, I need to see what it is. There it is. <laughs> Let's talk about integrity. Integrity is made up of two parts. We say that a bank has integrity. We say this platform has integrity. What does that mean? It ha the task for which it was assigned, 
the, the purpose. It performs its goal. And te- integrity is made up of two things. First of all, morality, which I define as not doing what's wrong. Thou shalt not steal, shalt not lie, shalt not bear false witness, shalt not commit adultery. So morality is not doing what's wrong, but you can sit on a couch all day and be moral. Integrity is more than that. It means it's trustworthy. You can count on it. It means that when there is a threat, there's character. And I define character as doing what is right. Now, the uh, critical question is, what is the definition of what is right? And there's only two definitions, only two. One is what I say is right, and the other is what God says is right. And those are the only two options, and that's what we're... So let's go to the part about, about economics. They don't, they don't want to see me, gang. I'll tell you, you just skip that. We'll just, we'll just use that up there. So Moses, God loving, was out going across the desert trying to keep all these people happy, and his father-in-law, Jethro, came up and said... Hey, Mo, God and I, we've been talking. You are wearing yourself out, son. And we, you need to get a federal, state, and local government. You need to have people of thousands, hundreds, and tens. And you have to put people in charge. And there's three requirements as to who you should have in government. Three. Number one, that is those that fear God. Because there's only two options. Those that fear God. For the fear, old English term, respect, honor the king. You fear the king. And those who think they're God. Those are only two options. And he said... And just as an aside, you don't want to marry a person who thinks they're God. And you don't want to go into business with a person who thinks they're... And the Bible says that you don't want to elect a person who thinks they're God. And so, how do we do that? Every barroom brawl, every schoolyard scuffle boils down to two words, and that is who says. And the only alternative is either what... I say, or what God says. So how how do you feel about gay marriage? The first words out of a politician's mouth. Well, I think, or God says. Those are the only two. And what I want to do is to help you pastors to feel comfortable. And as you understand what needs to be done, to understand how politics works. And once you see it, you'll be able to listen to a politician for 60 seconds, and you'll understand it. You say, well, Bob, that that sounds a, a little quick. Your daughter comes home with a... Seminary student. He was the Princeton Theological Seminary. And he's a great family, a good guy. Seems like he's good people. You ask him one question. Do you believe in the actual virgin birth of Jesus Christ? Well, now, you need to understand that in those days when we referred to women that were married oftentimes, from the answer to that one question, you could tell me 20 things about that guy. And with politics, it's the same way. And that is, either you believe that man created God, or you believe that God created man. And everybody is in one of those two categories. Either, man, you got here on your own, crawled out of the primordial slime and said, let's write a symphony, or God made us. And so if you believe that man created God, then you believe that man is his own standard. If you believe that God created man, you believe God has a standard. And here's the principle, listen... If you believe that man created God, then you believe man is basically good. By what standard would he not be good? He's his own standard. But you know that if God made us, that there's a shortage. Now, if man is basically good, then anything that he does is not wrong. It's not his fault. Because he's good. So if somebody comes in here and starts shooting people, intuitively we know that's not good. But... Couldn't be his fault because he's good. So whose fault is it? Well, it's got to be that gun's fault coming in here doing those nasty things. Isn't that awful? Why, they need to regulate that gun. And, and, and they think that that makes sense. Whereas we understand that, uh, finally, without God, where do rights come from? They come from the group. And so that's why you hear those people talk. You listen to the people on the left. They don't even say the word American. Nobody's an American. He's a Hispanic or he's a black. We believe in, in gay rights and we believe in women's rights and we believe in blonde left-handed rights. And if we believe that rights come from the group, whereas our founders were not ambivalent on the side, they knew where our rights come from. They came from God. Now, if that's the way that works, how is that implemented into public policy? It works like this. That is, if you believe that man is the source of all right and wrong, then you believe he needs to implement that, and therefore he will always want more government. So you may remember that 
when Bill Clinton was president, they said that if a person had a child, that they should they should not have to go to work for a few weeks, like get time off. And then I saw where Hillary was when she was running. They asked her, he said, you know, not all of us, Hillary, have children. Some of us have animals. And, and when our animals have, have a litter, why we have responsibility. I think we should have time off, too. She said, absolutely. I think, we, I think the employers should give them time off for, so the cat can have, have a litter. Now, see, there is an infinite capacity of these folks to come up with more government. But to tell you what to do. The, now, how do you get more government? The best way is to take money out of your pocket. That's the way I can control you. So these people will always want more taxes, they'll want fewer taxes. Those that are in control, they are not interested in defending our border or defending our country. They always want a weak defense, whereas the other folks want a strong defense. Now, now this, this gives Katie Couric a heart attack because she always says, you know, you people claim you want limited government and fewer taxes, and then you claim you, want, you always vote for a strong... Yeah, that's exactly correct. Because limited government gives us more freedom and fewer taxes give, and, and strong defense protects our freedom. And that is what government should do. And then finally is this. Without God, and since I am the standard, I can define marriage as between three men and a horse. <laughs> and then because I'm the standard, I can make it a hate crime for you to do what you just did. And that's not 1950s revival final sermon, someday in America it might, it's now. It is here. In the state of Michigan, in recent weeks signed by the governor, if a woman walks up to you and says, I am Napoleon, and you say, yes ma'am, in the state of Michigan, that is a felony to misgender a person. And it's a $250 fine in the city of New York for each time that you do it. Now, there is professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And so our founders understood that where do our rights come from? They come from God. So, so what we need to do, those that fear God. Secondly, men of truth. How much time we got? Got a quickie. Let me, you're going to hear a lot about truth. Let's just simply say, I can say this room 75 feet wide. You can say 65. Somebody else say it's 55. We'll just be pleased as much. We can talk about it. We can have white papers. We can go to United Nations conferences. We can go on and on until somebody comes in and measures it. And when that measurement is truth and the significance of truth, it exposes error. So when some little 10-year-old girl comes in and measures it and come to find out it's 89 feet wide, and I've said three times it's 75 feet, everybody in this room knows that what I said was wrong. Therefore, error hates truth. Therefore, and they'll all join together. That's why one little 90-pound female weakling from Turning Point can show up on a campus and thousands of people fall apart and the police and they're carrying on. Why? Because they can't stand truth because truth exposes error. I don't have to. Let, let me just do one more. I'll do it quickly. Truth not only reveals error, it, it overcomes error. And so you're prosecuting a guy for stealing the ATM machine. Defense counsel gets up, why he wouldn't do such a thing, why he loves his mother, and he was off in Portland having dinner with his sister, and here's the receipts. For you don't care what she says, because when you're finished, you're going to show a video, a security camera of him driving up to the ATM, putting a chain around it, and you see his face in the cameras. He leans over the fingerprints as he picks it up, and the truth will overcome the air such that the only way they can succeed is to prevent the presentation of truth. Your Honor, I object, I object, I object. Truth overcomes there. That's why I can pray at an inaugural in the name of, of Mother Earth and Eagle Feathers, and, and nobody cares. Why? If I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, all hell breaks loose. Why? Because I am the truth. And, truth, and Satan knows it. And here's the thing, that the only people that carry that message are the pastors. And Satan, the communists tried to take over this country 40 years after World War II. They took half of the country, half of the world after World War II under, 
under Truman. They let them have Bulgarian, Romanian, all that sort of thing. We just gave, gave it away. In the 1960s, we had a revolution burning our cities to the ground and taking over. They thought they were going to take over America, and they found out that the average American actually loved the country. And so they said, nope, here's how we do it. And you're going to hear from James Lindsay explain all this. This is how they said, we're going to get our institutions, and we're going to train those kids when they go through college. We're going to tell them that they hate America. And we're going to get into the seminaries, and we're going to teach the, the pastors. We're going to tell them that here's what you've got. You have a noble calling. Your calling is so noble that this lighthouse for the gospel, if you take all the money that goes for global evangelism from the other 96% of the world and you put it in a pile and you increase it five and a half times, that's still not as much as America gives. This is the standard for it. This is the one that when there's a parliamentarian fighting in New Zealand or in Argentina or wherever, they say, even in America, they look to America. So if I can get the pastors to not stand for righteousness, then these people will be wandering around and they're on a city council, they're on a school board, and they, this doesn't make sense, and who do I turn to? And they go to Pastor King, no, we don't get involved. We don't get involved. And the country has been allowed to, to, to drift off as a result. And so, now, we're in the process of reestablishing truth. And, and, and we know who, who that is. I don't, let's, let's go quickly to the final point, and that is this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. A gracious Jeffersonian way of saying any idiot ought to understand this. Be, be blind, deaf, and dumb, son. You ought to be, this is self-evident. That all men are created equal and endowed by a five to four decision of the Supreme Court. Are endowed by their creator. Now people say, well, now they, they don't know what they meant. They knew exactly what they meant. Every one of those people understood the word of God. Now they, since World War I, they, they've tried to deconstruct our founders. Benjamin Franklin, I got a card the other day. Somebody said he had 51 illegitimate children. I thought, you idiot. You know, that, that, would, that, that, would, be, that would be two a year for a quarter of a century in order to get. But the fact is, he paid a third, a, a, a third of, of the, for the first awakening of, of uh, Whitfield's uh, And so, I mean, there, you don't find any of those attacks prior to the 1920s. So in, in the course of doing that, who did they use? We hold these. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And who's that? Jesus Christ or the Word or God or Creator. They're all synonyms. Man is endowed by Jesus Christ. Man is endowed by God. Man is endowed by His Creator with certain inalienable rights among those who are life. Well... Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to get involved in that. As, as, Marth, as, as Beth Moore says, well, there was more important things than life. And as John Piper's preachers, he said, there's more important things than life. We never knew what they meant when they kept saying that, when, when she was supporting Hillary and things. What, what are you, what's, what's, what's downstream? There's other things other than life. What are other things other than life? Well, we found out, didn't we? Perverted marriage, transgenderism. All kinds of things are Once you go through that door, that's the principle. First life, then liberty. It's on Thomas Jefferson. The God who gave us life gave us liberty at the same time. Notice the sequence. See, life first, then liberty. Liberty is a precious little value if you're dead. You have to have life first, then liberty, then sewer systems and overpasses. But the first thing that you do is life. And the purpose of the United States, no other nation on earth, protects life. So Jews knew that they could be chased from all over the world. If they got into the canopy of protection, the American flag, that they would be saved because America protects life. And then liberty, and then the rest. Okay, rounding third, heading for home. Fear God, men of truth, hating socialism. Now listen, they told, they told, they told Moses, I don't have time to give you a whole course in government. Only three things. Here's the three things. Thirdly is hating socialism. That what, I majored in economics. I'm an economics major, which makes me an economist. I'm now going to tell you 95% of all the economics you'll ever need to know your entire life. Here it is. Let us suppose that that represents 100% of your income or any city, state, or nation. And let's suppose you go into Walmart and the most expensive thing in the store is $99. That means you are completely free to choose anything in the store. Let's suppose someone comes along and takes 25% of it away from it. What happens? Two things. Number one, some things you can't choose. Thomas Jefferson said freedom is having choices. The more choices I take away from you, the less freedom you have. Anybody who's ever raised a teenager has had this debate. And that is, the more, more money I take away from you, the lower your standard of living. Anybody could figure that out, unless you're with the New York Times, and then this would be a profundity. <laughs> Let us suppose that someone comes along and takes half of it. What happens? Fewer choices, less freedom, lower. Suppose someone comes along and takes 75 leisure. What happens? Fewer choices, less freedom, lower standard. Suppose someone comes along and takes it all. 
What do we call a person who works all day and keeps nothing? That person is called a slave. Now, two people can come and take money away from you. One is called a criminal, has a gun, and can take money away from you. The other is called a politician, has a gun, the government can come and take... Here's the point. The impact is the same. You go to the pay window, you walk out across the parking lot, a fellow comes up, puts a gun in your ribs, says, I'm with 50% of everything you got. You go home, sit home, your wife and children, this is the kind of house we can buy, this is the kind of car we can pay for, the kind of food we got, the kind of vacation we can take. Or you make it all the way to your pickup, you open up the paycheck and look at it. Uncle Sam's already been here. It's half gone. The impact is the same. And so here's the point. Remember, I told you I'm going to give you the economics. You're going to go back to spiritual in a moment. Watch, catch this. this the greater the freedom on that chart, the greater the wealth, the greater the government, the greater the poverty. And it only works this way every time. And so you show me, you sh- politics, politics is only this. Listen to me. Politics is only this. Which direction do we go on this chart? When I was in the state legislature in Ohio, we were number one in new job creation. Number one. We elected a governor and said, we can put a stop to this. And so at the last two governors, Ohio was 49th in new job creation. 49th. And for the first time in history, Ohio Buckeye said, thank God for Michigan. But nevertheless, the, uh, w- when, when, when Thatcher took over, the state of, it was an absolute free fall. The International Monetary Fund had taken over the control of the pound sterling. What she do? She cut taxes, put people back. The country began to take off by the time she left. It had the fourth largest economy in the world. When Jimmy left office, 22% interest rates, 18% inflation. The country's in a spiral. Gas. We, we have more gas than oil than any place on the earth. 50 years ago, we had even more than that, and yet we had gas lines because these guys can screw up a two-car funeral. And yet when America began to do what was right, by the end of the 1989, the end, three out of every four jobs created on this planet were created in one country, the United States of America. So all of it can be done if we understand how, how to do it. We don't have time for that. Here's the just truth understanding. People say, well, America's just hardworking, had natural climate, and had lots of natural re- bull. North and South Korea, same heritage, culture, climate, language. North Korea, last in the decade of the 90s, 10% starved to death. South Korea, same heritage, culture, language, 10th largest GDP in the world. Japan thought they could attack America, not a smart thing to do. And at the end of World War II, this is what Nagasaki looked like. At the time that Nagasaki was in this condition, the richest city in the history of mankind was a place called Detroit, Michigan. And yet, uh, as we gave freedom, America doesn't, no nation has ever done what America, a couple of quickies. Never has a nation had a power to overrun another nation, but what it didn't do it. The only time there's ever been peace when the balance of power, except the United States of America after World War II, we could own the entire world and we didn't. So we, Japan, we could own, but we gave it freedom. There's what Nagasaki looks like today. At the time that, that uh, Nagasaki looked like that, as I said, d- Detroit was the richest city in the world. Now it looks like this because they have increased the cost of government and corruption to the point that people have fled it. The population of Detroit is lower than it was in 1900, and it's the poorest city north of the Rio Grande. If you understand how to do this, you can make any rich place poor or any poor place rich. Final concluding thought. Let's keep your seatbelt on. This is the most important thing you need to know. Why is it that socialism never works? Let us say that you're going to buy something for yourself. You care about two things. You care about price and quality. Nobody can make that decision as well as you can. You might pay $5 for a cup of coffee at 7 in the morning, for which you wouldn't pay 70 cents at 2 in the afternoon. When you're buying it for yourself, you care about two things. You care about price and quality. Let's suppose you're going to buy something for someone else. Do you care about the price? Yep, because you're paying for it. But you're a little more flexible on the quality. (laughs) Eh, by the time it breaks, they'll be married for four years. They'll forget who gave it to them anyway. Yeah, this will be fine. We've all bought things for people we never would have bought for ourselves. We all receive things as gifts. Do we care about the price? Yep. Do we care about the quality? Not so much. Let us suppose you're going to consume it. If you're going to consume it, you care about the quality. Absolutely. But you're not going to pay for it. If you're not going to pay for it, you don't care about the price. And so the waitress comes along and says, would you like to have some, some orange juice? And you say, uh, well, how much is it? And she says, well, it's three fifty a glass. You know? Yeah, really, I'm fine. I don't need it. Oh, you got the pancakes. Well, it comes with the pancakes. Well, in that case, pour away. I'll take three glasses. You might go off and leave half a glass. You wouldn't if you're paying for it. Do you care about the quality? Yes, because you're consuming it. You're not concerned about the price because you're not paying for it. 
And you show me what percentage of the GDP of any city or state or nation the principle applies, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth, the greater the government, the greater the poverty. Now, that only works if we have people we can trust. We can only have people we trust if people will have a godly center. We can only have people that are godly centered if the churches arise and point. And there have been time after time when the politicians that I work with on the city council, on the school board, on the whatever, and what do I do here? And they turn, and you've got to stop and think that the seminaries, when they preach this stuff, you think, where are they supposed to go? To the, to the editorial board? Do they go to the Chamber of Commerce? Where do they go to? They have to go to God's. And when we slam the door on them for 40 years, we've taken this great lighthouse for the gospel and put it on a shaky ground. That's why God has called you for this moment. He's not finished. Rest assured, you know, I, I remember when they t captured the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. In our devotions that morning, my father explained to me, see this? Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When Christ was on earth, the Jews didn't control the Temple Mount. But now it's all over. The Lord is coming back next Tuesday a week. It's all done because now the, the church age is over. Well, that's 67, 77, 87, 97, 2007, 2017. We don't know when the Lord's coming. I promise you, I don't think it's going to be within the next month or two. We've got a lot of work to do. He's counting on you. God bless you. Amen.